In Chicago, Obama's adopted hometown, there were 500 homicides last year. They are on track for 600 this year, or the equivalent of two Sandy Hooks per month in one city. Demographically, Chicago is about a third black, a third white, and a third Hispanic. However, 70% of the homicides were committed by black people, and almost all of the victims were also black people. In New York, about 45% of the city is white, about 17 to 20% black, about the same number Hispanic. Over 90% of the homicides were committed by black and brown people, and almost always the victims are other black and brown people. Now, unless we're prepared to say that black and brown people are genetically disposed to commit crime, we have to ask ourselves what the hell is going on here. Now, there are a couple of culprits. You could blame racism. Problem with that is uh, during Jim Crow, when racism was both legal and factual, you didn't have this kind of criminality. You could blame poverty. But during the Great Depression, 50% of black adults were unemployed. You didn't find this kind of criminality. What does that leave you? It leaves you 50 years of left-wing policies begun with the best of intentions when Lyndon Johnson launched the war on poverty in 1965 and dispatched people to go door to door to advise women of their rights to welfare benefits, provided there was no man in the house. Within three years, welfare roles increased 100%. And now we have this kind of pathology. So what do you do if you're a left-wing person? You blame high-capacity magazines, you blame racism, you blame poverty, you blame global warming, you do anything at all but look at yourself in the mirror and say, good Lord, what have I done to this country? 50 years of rewarding people for making slovenly decisions and allowing men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. Bill Cosby calls such men unwed fathers. We know it works. James Q. Wilson from UCLA said it's very simple. In order to make it to the middle class, you have to do three things. Finish high school, don't have a kid before you're 20, and get married before you have that kid. If you do that, you won't be poor. If you fail to follow that, you will be. The question is, what are we doing to encourage or discourage people from following that formula? And the answer is the welfare state. In 1965, when over the objections of the left, left wing of his party, Bill Clinton signed the Welfare Reform Act, John Lewis, who marched with Martin Luther King, told us that this was horrific, it was an assault on the poor. What happened? Welfare rolls declined by 50% without a corresponding increase in abortion. It turns out there were a whole bunch of able-bodied and able-minded people who were on the couch who got off the couch and got into the market. In the 80s, the right ring rag, the LA Times, uh, had a poll where both poor people and non-poor people were asked the following question. Do young poor women often have children to get welfare benefits? Not too surprisingly, the majority of non-poor people said no. 44% said that young poor women often have children to get welfare benefits. Most did not believe that. Poor people were asked the same question. Do you believe that young poor women often have children to get welfare benefits? 64% said often. So they're telling us we're just not listening. I had Kwesi Mfume on my show once, one of the few so-called black leaders who deigned to come on my show. In 20 years, I haven't been able to get Jesse Jackson or Sharpton or Farrakhan, but Kwesi Mfume did come on. And I said, Mr. Mfume, he, at the time he was head of the NAACP, as between the presence of white racism or the absence of black fathers, which poses the bigger threat to the black community? And his credit, without missing a beat, he said the absence of black fathers. There's a director named John Singleton. He's from South Central, as am I. He went to Crenshaw High School, as did I. He did a couple of movies. One was called Boys in the Hood about 20 years ago. Uh, very entertaining movie, but I think a lot of people were swept away by the entertainment value of it, didn't understand the point of the movie. There were two families that were profiled. One was the Cuba Gooding Jr. family, whose father was played by Lawrence Fishburne, actively involved in his life, didn't even marry his mom, but was actively involved in his life. And when um, Cuba Gooding Jr. Was, was about 12 or 13 in the movie, the father took him in. Across the street lived the Ice Cube family, Father A. Wall, and the fates of the two families were very different. If that was too subtle for you, John Singleton did another movie after that one called Baby Boy, which nobody saw because it wasn't as good a movie, but arguably had a more important message. And it was about the sexual irresponsible behavior of a lot of young men in the inner city, including uh, a character played by Snoop Dogg, another character played uh, by, uh, I think his name was Tyrese Gibson. And they both had kids uh, by two different women um, outside of wedlock, never married either one of them. This is John Singleton. So. They're telling us, we're just not listening. There are no fathers. 
And there's a direct line between this and all the other social problems that I talked about. So, what are we going to do about it? We have to get rid of federal welfare, no questions asked, federal welfare, and welfare should be done at the state and local level, ideally by individuals and by nonprofits. I was a loaned executive for United Way several years ago. For three months, I worked for them. I was amazed at how efficient they were. You donate a dollar to United Way, and 90 or 95 cents of that dollar gets down to the intended beneficiary. A dollar government welfare, according to Tom Sowell, Walter Williams, 70 cents is lost in transfer costs. So for every dollar that is supposed to go to for welfare at the federal level, the actual beneficiaries get about 30 cents on the dollar. So forget about even just the uh, morality of it, just as far as being more efficient. It's more efficient for the private sector to deal with the needy than it is for the government to do it. One of the, um, one of the many things that I learned when I was uh, growing up was the value of hard work. My mother often tells this story about how when I was a kid I wanted a black Schwinn bicycle. And you could send away and order a big box of, of cards. You had to sell them off and they were on uh, the back of a comic book you could send away for them. And I was always sending away for stuff. So I get this big box of Christmas cards in the, in the, in the mail. This is May or June. So I'm slipping around selling all these cards. And my dad said he felt sorry for me. It was hot. It was the summer. And he thought, what I'll do, Larry, is I'll buy the Schwinn bike for you. And then you can sell the cards and reimburse me after you sell all the cards. I said, fantastic. So my dad bought all these Christmas cards. And he bought the bike for me and told me to resell the boxes. And I could reimburse him for all the, uh, the money that he spent uh, on the bicycle. How many bikes, how many Christmas cards did I sell after I got my bicycle? Put it like this, Manny, if you want a box of Christmas cards, come by my house, I got a box for you in the closet. <laughs> and, it, and it was about initiative, and it was about initiative. My dad said it was a huge mistake that he made, he'd taken away my initiative. Now I'm somebody who hustled, who worked really hard, I always had paper routes, did this, I did that, I was always hustling, and my dad said this was a powerful lesson to him about the damage done when you take away people's initiative, which gets back to the welfare state. Laziness is one of the easiest things for people to, to do. It's one of the hardest things for people to avoid. You give people an excuse, they'll take it. Black, white, indifferent. And this is the damage that we've done with the welfare state. I was lucky enough to have a mother uh, who stayed on me. She embraced education, she embraced hard work, and she would refuse to allow my brothers and me to ever think of ourselves as a victim. Whenever we ever came home and told her some story of some taunt or some slight, she wouldn't have it. It was her position that nobody can make you feel inferior without your permission. So one day in school we read this poem, and it pissed everybody off, including the teacher. I was angry. Everybody was angry. And the poem went like this. While riding through a Baltimore so small and full of glee, I saw a young Baltimorean keep looking at me. Now I was young and very small, and he was no whit bigger, and so I smiled, but he poked out his tongue and called me nigger. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until September. Of all the things that happened there, that's all that I remember. As I said, I was upset, teacher was upset, everybody was upset. Teacher was talking about the permanent damage this was due to his psyche, the strain of, of racism, how this kid was never gonna be the same. So I went home, and my mother was stirring a big pot of greens on the stove, I'll never forget it. I said, Mom, we read a poem in class, I wanna run it by you, see what you think. She said, sure, go ahead. I said, well, it went something like this. While riding through old Baltimore, so small and full of glee, I saw a young Baltimorean keep looking straight at me. Now, I was young and very small, but he was no whit bigger. And so I smiled, but he poked out his tongue and called me nigger. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until September. Of all the things that happened there, that's all that I remember. My mother took the spoon out of the pot, wrapped it on the side, turned to me, and she said, Larry, it's too bad he let something so trivial spoil his vacation. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. May God bless you, and may God continue to bless the United States of America. I want to give you a story. It's about messaging and talking to people and, and persuading them. My father um, was uh, almost 96 years old when he died, and I had the good fortune to be able to spend a lot of time with him the last couple of years, uh, just doing stuff with him, errands, taking him to his doctor appointment. Um, and my father, we go to this barber, 
And I, he said, you know, I'm not sure you want to go with me because she talks a lot and she's a liberal and you may find her annoying. And I said, no, let, let's go. So I went and it's a, it was a black woman and she was bitching about schools. They were crappy schools. She was bitching about these kids getting pregnant. She was just bitching about society. And finally she turned to me and she said, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm thinking about running for office. This is the time I was thinking about running against Barbara Boxer. And she said, good, we need more black politicians like Obama. And I said, I said, well, I'm nothing like Obama other than we're both black. I said, I'm a Republican. <laughs> Talk about expelling gas in church. <laughs> and I said, now, wait a second. You were just complaining about the quality of these schools. You were just complaining about the fact that parents had to send their kid to a school that you don't like. Republicans are the ones that want to empower parents to be able to take their kid out of a bad school and put their kid into a good school. It's called vouchers. I said, you were just complaining about welfare. Republicans are the ones that pushed the Welfare Reform Act of 1996 that caused welfare rolls to decline by 50%. And she said, do you have a card? <laughs>